the University of York and Harvard University in the US, David Reich's lab at Harvard University. And also I, at the time I was working at the, at the Natural History Museum on this uh, project that's called the Comios Project, which is this big ERC, uh, European Research Council funded project at the University of York led by uh, Ian Armit, who is looking at um, migration mobility uh, in Iron Age Britain by looking at doing massive osteological analysis, stable isotopes, DNA, sort of the whole works on a bunch of Iron Age skeletons from around Britain. And this is um, essentially a summary of what we found from skeletons dating to uh, the end of the Bronze Age and uh, uh, and uh, the Iron Age, and this came out just before uh, Christmas as a paper. Um, so some of you may be already be aware, aware of some of it, but hopefully I can provide some extra detail which um, wasn't necessarily associated with the papers. So to begin with, I need to go through some details, which particularly if you saw my previous talk, a lot of you will be uh, familiar with, and just to set the scene for why we decided to do this uh, particular study. So, uh, there are different types of what are called uh, genetic ancestries, and th th this is essentially a genetic signature of people who share uh, recent um, uh, ancestry with, with one another. There were sort of three uh, relevant uh, genetic ancestries um, that are relevant to this discussion about prehistoric West Eurasia and, and, and uh, Britain specifically. There's uh, the Western European hunter-gatherer uh, cluster who uh, at the beginning of the Holocene occupied uh, most of um, Europe. There's the early European farmer or EEF uh, ancestry, which uh, again at the beginning of the Holocene uh, mainly would form, it was mainly sort of um, concentrated in uh, Anatolia. And then later on you get this formation around 5000 BC of this western steppe herder ancestry, which is in a uh, uh, the far eastern part of Europe around the, the Black Sea, which is um, derived from an actually mixing between um, two other populations who occupied uh, Eastern Europe and um, uh, what, what is now present day uh, Iran and who mixed around um, uh, uh, the Black Sea. So these are the three ancestries that through the through the early part of the Holocene and, and where, through prehistory, European prehistory, um, as we'll see, mix mixed together to form sort of the, the prehistoric populations of, uh, of Europe. So uh, in Mesolithic Britain and Mesolithic Europe, generally is these Western hunter gatherers um, personified, of course, uh, for Britain by uh, Cheddar Man. Uh, and they, um, that genetic signature first appears in Britain are probably around 14,000 years ago. And uh, these groups live um, more or less continuously. We're not sure if there's a slight break at the Younger Dry Dryas climatic event, which um, essentially turns Britain back to um, uh, glacial conditions for a, a few hundred years before going back again, whether there's a break. But um, when it's Br uh, Britain is reoccupied again, it's reoccupied by um, these Western hunter gatherer groups. Uh, who persist in Britain for uh, up until around 6,000 years ago. Um, what you're having in the interim is um, that this EEF ancestry, which was in Anatolia, uh, spreads uh, through Europe. So there are migrations out of Anatolia that over thousands of years, so these are very, um, they're not migrations in the sense maybe that we think about them today, but very slow um, movements of people over generations and, and thousands of years across Europe. These um, people carrying this Anatolian EEF ancestry mix with the local Western uh, hunter-gatherer peoples as they as they move across Europe. So you get this uh, mixture of predominantly this Anatolian ancestry, but with some Western hunter-gatherer ancestry from various uh, parts of Europe. Uh, in, in Neolithic Britain, um, which starts around 4000 BC, from 4000 BC, we, we start to see people with a substantial amount of of this Anatolian Neolithic ancestry. And at the beginning, we have some evidence, particularly in Western Scotland, of uh, the, these migrations of people into Britain carrying this Anatolian ancestry. They're probably coming from uh, various parts of, of um, proximate areas of Northern Europe, so present day France and Western Europe, present day France, um, and uh, carrying this sort of ancestry that's proximately from um, Anatolia. And when they initially start coming in, particularly in Western Scotland, we see uh, them mixing with the local population. But after a few hundred years, 
there's essentially very little of the signature of the Western hunter gatherers who lived in Britain after that point. So if you look at these, um, these different triplets of bars reflect Neolithic populations when we uh, of Britain when we model them as 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 different groups and we try to fit different types of ancestry to them. So if we just try and fit them as uh, an totally Neolithic ancestry and Western hunter gatherer ancestry, they seem to have an appreciable amount of the red Western hunter gatherer ancestry. But as I mentioned, as Neolithic farmers moved across Europe, they picked up more Western hunter gatherer ancestry from the continent. So when we take that into account. Um, there's at least, a, which is more reflected in these green and, and gray figures, there's, uh, well, it's been estimated that there's at least a 99% shift, shift in the genetics of the occupants of Britain um, over that early Neolithic uh, period. So the, the, me, the, the genetic signature of Mesolithic, Mesolithic inhabitants of Britain sort of almost um, totally disappears. Um, and then uh, starting around 2,800, maybe a bit earlier, maybe more, uh, uh, maybe a bit earlier uh, than that 2800 BC, you get this Western steppe herd ancestry, which expands out of uh, the Pontic Caspian steppe uh, in Eastern Europe and moves uh, into the rest of Europe. So there are migrations of people carrying this Western steppe herd ancestry um, uh, across particularly Northern and Central Europe, although it also does penetrate to a lesser extent into parts of Southern and Southeastern Europe. Um, and in Britain, the arrival of this sort of step ancestry is uh, associated with the development of uh, what are called beaker cultures, um, defined by these particular types of pots that you tend to get in burials, although I do appear on settlements as well. Um, and over this period from around 2450 BC to 2000 BC, there's a, at least a 93% shift of the genetic ancestry from the Neolithic inhabit inhabitants. So again, a big um uh genetic um change that happens there although as i stressed in a, if you saw my previous talk um there's probably a, a period between 2450 and 2000 bc where you have groups that have this um uh step related ancestry and groups that have ancestry from uh derived from the british neolithic sort of persisting in britain living sort of um in parallel for a few hundred years before they merge uh, completely and for whatever reason the Neolithic population of Britain has a very small legacy in the uh, Bronze Age in inhabitants of Britain and it's likely that these uh, migrations into Britain that bring this step ancestry are probably primarily coming from sort of the uh, uh, lower Rhine uh, Valley so somewhere around the present day Netherlands. Um, so the reason why we decided to do this study looking at the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age is that that this farmer ancestry, when we look at um, people who have whose ancestry mainly comes from Britain today, whose recent ancestry mainly comes from Britain, we can see that um, people from England have higher levels of that early farmer ancestry than people who uh, uh, live in Scotland. Um, and this ancestry is higher in England than it is in the Bronze Age uh, inhabitants of Britain. So what this suggests is that sometime between the Bronze Age and today, uh, that level of that of the farmer ancestry in Britain has increased, uh, and that must be as a result to some extent potentially of, of further migrations into Britain that we we hadn't yet detected. So what we wanted to find out, and uh, this is unlikely to be because of migrations that happened in the first any migration that happened in the first millennium uh, AD, so CE, uh, because uh, if those migrations indeed as is postulated were coming from parts of Scandinavia, um, northern central Europe, then they would actually be carrying more step ancestry and less farmer ancestry. So something happens uh, at a different time which brings in more of this early farmer ancestry uh, into Britain and we wanted to find out when that was happening. Uh, and we did this by looking at uh, genomes dating to all from Britain and from, sorry I'm keeps doing this, uh, genomes from Britain and from other European countries from different, lots of different periods uh, from the Neolithic, Calcolithic, Early Bronze Age, um, Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age and Iron Age, but particularly concentrated on the Iron Age uh, to see if we can see when this change occurs. So this is, so we also sampled a lot from continental Europe as well, so that we could try and understand uh, potentially where the source of any ancestry change was, was coming from. So there's around 400 samples, new samples that we uh, produced from um, 
Britain, mainly dating to the Middle Bronze Age to the Iron Age, so from around 1500 BC up until the Roman conquest in uh, 43 AD. And um, this um, chart in the bottom right hand corner that you can see the uh, black dots are new samples and you can see that the, the bottom column is Britain and the vast majority of samples that new samples that we acquired were uh, uh, from the Iron Age, but we got a few more from the Middle and Late uh, Bronze Age. Um, the, the sampling of, of Middle and Late Bronze Age samples is particularly thin just because um, there are very few burials dating to this period from Britain. The, uh, there are a few cremations, but the idea is that people were doing things with the dead in this period that leave no archaeological record. So we, we seem to be missing a lot of bodies that should be there from the Middle to Late Bronze Age. So it's likely they maybe ended up in rivers or in the sea or... Um, up trees perhaps. Uh, so when we looked at these uh, genomes um, from Britain, what we saw was that uh, from middle to late Bronze Age and Iron Age Britain, what we see is that that early farmer ancestry uh, over time uh, increases uh, in England and Wales. So watch it looking at the blue markers uh, through time. In England and Wales that, e that early farmer ancestry fraction increases through the Middle and Late Bronze Age and into the Iron Age. Whereas in Northern Britain, so present day Scotland, it stays the same over the same period. And um, one of the theories to begin with was that there was an idea, as I, as I mentioned in the, in the early Bronze Age, we have, and the Calcolithic, we have evidence that you have two pop groups um, uh, living sort of um, uh, parallel to one another, one that has more ancestors of the step related ancestry from continental Europe, one that has more of the ancestry from Neolithic Britain. Uh, and so one of the ideas was perhaps these groups actually persisted for a lot longer than that and a millennia or more and sort of um, merged more fully um, in the Middle Bronze Age. So what you're actually seeing is not in, with this increase in farmer ancestry is not necessarily a new group coming in, but um, um, sort of the the groups that lived in Britain during the near uh, the groups who are mainly descended from groups who are living in Britain during the Neolithic mixing more with um, these people who came in during the Calcolithic and early Bronze Age, but when we tested that scenario, basically the the type of ancestry that we see in Britain from the Middle Bronze Age doesn't fit um, what is in Neolithic what is in Britain during the Neolithic. It's a different type of ancestry that must be coming from continental Europe. So this sort of confirmed that it's not some resurgence of the local Neolithic populations, it has to be migration into Britain from uh, somewhere else. Um, so uh, this is sort of a more detailed uh, map of what, uh, sort of a chart of what, what I was showing you before. So again, you have all the uh, samples that we had um, and how much of this early farmer ancestry that they carried and then time at the bottom. You can see that during the Calcolithic, an early Bronze Age, so from about 2400 to 1800 BC, you see that uh, all, all the red dots, sorry, uh, are ancestry outliers, so of ancestry that is significantly different from the, the mean level of ancestry. Uh, so you can see that during the, uh, the Calcolithic to early Bronze Age, you have lots and lots of outliers. Um, and this black um, line on this chart underneath is sort of tracking the percentage of um, the population that are, that are ancestry outliers that essentially are probably either migrants from somewhere else or in this case may have significantly admixed with the local populations that are continuous with the with, with the neolithic so you can see that during the the early bronze age and calcolithic as expected you have high levels of outliers um during this time where you're, you we've got good evidence that there's migrations coming into britain uh, what's interesting is that you not only have um uh, people who show evidence of having admixed with local Neolithic populations who are sort of towards the top of the graph, but you also have people sort of towards the bottom of the graph who um, suggest that they're coming from different areas of, of Europe. So even though that there, there's a predominant ancestry stream coming from probably the Lower Rhine Valley, um, you also have evidence that there's other bits of pieces of other streams of mi more minor migrations coming from potentially further east and there's also some evidence for further migrations coming from maybe um, further south so parts of southern and, and western europe so the sense that you get in the part of in the calcolithic and early bronze age is um that you're, you've almost got this sort of melting pot of people with different ancestries people with ancestry from uh different parts of um 
continental Europe, as well as ancestry from the local Neolithic populations in Britain, all sort of mixing together. After this point, from around 1800 to 1500 BC, the ancestry remains fairly stable, and you don't really get many outliers turning up. And then what happens is when you hit around 1500 BC, is outliers start turning up again, so likely um, uh, migrants who are bringing ancestry in from, from elsewhere. And you can see that the number of outliers during the Middle Bronze Age and Late Bronze Age um, uh, increases uh, again and then goes back down during the Iron Age. So we have good evidence for um, uh, sort of first generation migrants coming into uh, Britain during the Middle and Late Bronze Age and then that drops off uh, in, into, the, into the Iron Age, suggesting migration that the late, Middle to Late Bronze Age is another uh, sort of peak of human mobility into Britain. And it's interesting to uh, pick out a couple of these ancestry outliers. So uh, the two, the four earliest, there are two from a site called Margaret's Pit in, in Kent, um, dating to um, between 1391 and 1131 BC and 1260 and 1050 BC, and two from Cliffs Farm, Kent, uh, both dating to around 911 to 810 BC. And their, the level of their ancestry, again, suggests that the amount of this early farm ancestry that they have is, is anomalous and suggests that they were probably first generation migrants or that they were the descendants of a community of migrants that had moved into uh, Britain slightly earlier and had sort of uh, formed an enclave and kept themselves to themselves and sort of um, uh, reproduced amongst themselves. And so you have a local person, but someone who has ancestry that is fairly anomalous for the rest of Britain uh, generally. Um, it's interesting because the um, stable the, the, these skeletons were subject to stable isotope analysis, and when combined with the ancestry with this high level of early farmer ancestry, it uh, indicated a, 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 when you triangulate those two things together with the stable isotopes and the ancestry, the most probable origin is maybe somewhere in the uh, uh, around the Alps, um, particularly possibly the, the French side of the Alps. Um, and this indicates sort of that you're definitely getting potentially quite long distance movements of individuals or groups. What it also suggests as well is that, uh, as you might expect, uh, given the route from Calais, that um, uh, southeastern, uh, Southeast Britain, Kent particularly, was the major hotspot for these, these, these migrations at, at this time. And to be honest, at the beginning, we actually only see this ancestry change in Kent, uh, and then it spreads out uh, later. So Kent is definitely the epicenter of these uh, population movements that eventually go on to affect uh, the whole country. Um, and then and then highlighting uh, some samples that I think are actually in um, Wiltshire Museum from Blackberry Field Potter uh, in Wiltshire. Um, this is, uh, there's a, a human tooth from, the, this site is actually a big a settlement, but uh, associated with a huge Midden, and this is one of the things that characterizes the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. You start is you get these uh, huge midden uh, structures made of domestic waste um, that are sort of almost monuments in of themselves because they're so huge. And one of the ideas is that this is um, uh, to do with uh, uh, feasting uh, and so excessive feasting uh, at this time that's producing all this rubbish. But um, they're interesting, and in there is some ritual element to them as well. And you get um, sometimes human bones turning up, up in them. And from one of these, this, this uh, midden in Potter and Wiltshire, there was a human tooth that was um, included in this deposit. And this dated to around between 950 and 750 BC. So right at the end of the, right at the, end of the Bronze Age. And it's interesting because this individual is the first one person outside of Kent to show this ancestry change that, that we'd previously seen sort of starting to occur in Kent. So certainly by this point, uh, this ancestry uh, started affecting uh, changes uh, that these migrations had sort of the ancestry that these migrations introduced had sort of dispersed into Kent. What's interesting is that this person wasn't uh, had sorry had dispersed to Wiltshire, and this person wasn't a first gener. Their ancestry didn't suggest they were a first generation migrant, but that they were uh, uh, the result of a mixing between uh, the descendants of these migrants and look and people who were already living in Wiltshire. So. At this point, that it was at this point by around 950 to 750 BC, seemingly that this ancestry transformation had already taken place um, uh, in Wiltshire. And it's interesting because it coincides with the de development of um, uh, 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 of these sort of midden structures. And one of the, as I'll talk about later, one of the material culture changes that you see around here is that it, or around Europe generally, is that um, 
the, the sort of the share, use of the shared use of this sort of this particular type of feasting equipment. So it could be that these middens are linked to rights and practices that are in part introduced by uh, these 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 migrations. And so we sort of have almost a, a smoking gun here that of the association between this ancestry change and the development of the uh, Potern um, midden. So um, when we look at other samples from uh, different parts of Europe from around the same time. It's, it's interesting because there is um, ancestry shifts of a similar magnitude going on all over different parts of Europe. So in Bohemia and the Netherlands, uh, farmer ancestry increases, and we see the opposite in Iberia. The um, farmer ancestry uh, decreases with little or no change in, in present day France and present day Hungary. So what, what this indicates is that the result from Britain is, is sort of in the context of a peak of human mobility around Europe um, more, uh, more generally that at the time sort of Iberia had, uh, th there's basically a decline of this uh, farmer ancestry where people in Northern Europe have less, people in Southern Europe have more. So at some, uh, to some level, you're just getting a homo homogenized it. People are moving around a lot and it's homogenizing all the ancestry. So obviously people in Northern Europe get more farmer ancestry and people in, um, Southern Europe get less of it because of the, because people are just moving around generally and are highly mobile and that's homogenizing the ancestry around uh, Europe more generally. So this period between uh, 1500 and 800 BC seems to be just generally a, a very a period where of increased mobility uh, all around in different parts of Europe resulting in genetic homo homogenization. Um, uh, and, and that makes sense in, in this in the, the um, uh, from some of the material cultural evidences as, as well. And this recent study by Williamson, uh, like, uh, Le Calier de um looked at sources of uh, copper in, or sources of metal in uh, Britain. And you can see that through the, the early Bronze Age and, and particularly the, the later part of the early Bronze Age into the Middle Bronze Age, uh, most of the metal, so uh, most of the metal that you find in Britain is coming from Britain itself. But around, starting from around, 1400, 1500 BC, almost all of the metal starts coming from places on the continent. So uh, you can see it's not just a, a peak of human mobility, but also potentially a peak of, of um, continental wide uh, trade. And, um, and that, that is sort of one thing that could be driving this um, mobility of people. And uh, again, the context for, for this is, is this period called the Atlantic uh, or the other uh, series of um, linked societies known as sort of uh, the Atlantic Bronze Age and also Urnfield systems who sort of share some cultural traits, like I said, metal sources um, and some uh, uh, material culture, all suggesting that there's, um, as well as being a period of migration that you get uh, in this period, you get an intensification of um, interaction in terms of trade and exchange. Uh, between various different parts uh, uh, of Europe, and you get si similar things appearing in in, in different areas of uh, uh, of Europe, including some of the things um, written uh, here. So the, the idea that, that that people are becoming more mobile makes sense in this context of of greater uh, trade and um, and sort of shared ritual practices as well. Um, when we try to find if there was sort of a single source that could explain this answer to come into, into Britain, it was difficult to um, find a single source. What was interesting is that the best, when we sort of uh, look at basically this ancestry spreads out all through Britain. And when we try to see what the best source for that ancestry is actually the best source, better than any of the continental populations that we sampled was actually those two outliers from Margaret's Pit and Cliffs End Farm. So this suggests that those two that we haven't actually sampled the main group that these migrations are related to, um, but that um, those two, those individuals from Kent uh, represent migrants from that area. We just don't know exactly where that, that um, uh, area is. So we know that those migrations into Kent were part of the larger phenomenon, which then drove ancestry change in the rest of uh, Britain, because they're the best models for the ancestry change that we see in, in, in the rest of Britain. All other good fits for the ancestry change in Britain are Bronze Age and Iron Age populations of France. So again, this again point as well as that stabilised top evidence I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, 
there seems to be an influence of migrations from possibly southern Al uh, Alpine France. Um, and these migrations on average uh, result in a substantial shift of around half of the ancestry in southern Britain. So there is a slight change in, in, in what is now Scotland in ancestry, but this has a much bigger effect on, um, on uh, southern Britain. Um, and it's likely that some of this is seems to be migrations predominantly radiating, radiating out of maybe southern France, but there is also some churn, as I've illustrated here with this little butter boy, um, that populations are just more mobile generally and are mixing more. So it might be difficult to actually track down the source because you have just actually a mixed signature of, because sort of everybody seems to be moving um, everywhere to some extent in this period and changing the ancestry in all adjacent areas. But there also is a, a, a signal of uh, groups moving specifically from possibly somewhere in southern uh, France. Um, and I just, this is a bit of a, a rough and ready map, but this is a map of uh, the ancestry change by the beginning of the Iron Age, so, so after 800 uh, BC, in various different parts of Britain. So the orange represents the amount of this uh, ancestry from continental Europe that's coming in. So you can see that essentially um, there's a pattern where the further west or the further north you go, the sort of uh, lower amounts of that this continental ancestry penetrates, but it goes uh, quite far north into northern England, but then there's a big drop off when you reach um, present day Scotland. And in fact, I think it's some of the, even though it's showing slight continental ancestry, it's not actually significantly greater than zero in um, Scotland to some extent. But you can see that, uh, so I haven't got a, a little circle over Wiltshire, but it's essentially the same as as the one for sort of South Central Britain. It's about 50 to 60% ancestry change uh, in Wiltshire as, as a result of these migrations. So they, they begin in Kent and then dissipate through most of the rest of um, uh, southern Britain um, and into various areas um, with, with highly regional effects, depending on whereabouts you are. I mean, Wales looks highly variable, but we don't actually have that many samples from Wales. So you can take a Welsh results with a little pinch of salt, but um, it, we could say that they probably did affect Wales, uh, just the exact extent to which it affected what is now Wales um, might be de uh, debatable. Um, and what was interesting is that uh, these ancestry components stay stable then through the rest of the Iron Age. So um, we don't see any evidence for any other significant movements of people or very substantial movements of people into Britain once these this ancestry change has taken place, suggesting that there aren't, we can see odd individuals that look like they might have migrated into Britain from elsewhere, but they don't seem to significantly change the ancestry of people living here. So there doesn't seem to be um, substantial movements of groups of people like we probably are seeing in the um, at the end of the Bronze Age in, in the Iron Age. But also what we can do with the Iron Age is look at different regional populations of Britain to see um, how they compare with, with each other. And one of the interesting findings, uh, again, that was reported in this paper was the results from these uh, East Yorkshire uh, Aras burials. If, if you're not familiar with these, these are some idiosyncratic Iron Age burials that occur specifically in East Yorkshire uh, involving uh, cemeteries of these very characteristic square ditched barrows, some of which um, have chariots buried with them, one of the most famous of which is this Pocklington chariot burial, where the horses were buried with the chariot, stood up in the grave and um, were sort of presumably killed just before the grave was um, uh, completed. And then it's long been noted that sort of some of the, that these uh, people share similarities with, cultural similarities with uh, some Iron Age uh, peoples uh, in the Paris basin known as the uh, Parasai. And um, um, also I th uh, they, they, these East Yorkshire people, the Romans gave them a name which was something very similar to Parasai as well. So it's long been thought that there might have be that somehow there was some migration from the Paris Basin into East Yorkshire during the uh, Iron Age um, that sort of uh, seeded this, this population and um, they, they uh, were sort of directly descended from uh, migrations into uh, East Yorkshire from present day France during the Iron Age. When we look at the genetics of these burials, we have quite a few burials, Aras burials now, they, they don't seem to have any additional continental ancestry. So they have no more continental ancestry than what seems to come into Britain during the uh, uh, late Bronze Age. Um, but they are very sort of 
comparatively speaking, highly differentiated genetically from other Iron Age populations of Britain. So they're more different from people buried in these barrows are more different from all the other populations of Britain than each of those populations Britain, of Britain are different from each other. So they're sort of uh, highly differentiated. Uh, it's difficult to know exactly what this means. There's definitely something different about the people buried in these mounds, uh, in these in these cemeteries. But we don't know whether this could be because uh, of migrations that have affected East Yorkshire, particularly that we can't see yet. So fitting that model uh, potentially of migration, further migration from continental Europe into East Yorkshire specifically. Uh, or it could be that they were just a very insular population uh, and were very uh, endogamous. So um, what that can do is you get this um, process called genetic drift, which accelerates uh, if, if you're mainly um, uh, bre uh, in reproducing amongst a small population, that creates this process genetic drift, which can sometimes rapidly uh, accelerate the rate of difference from other populations that you're no longer sort of reproducing with. So it could just be that the, these people in East Yorkshire were mainly reproducing amongst themselves and so sort of drifted off uh, genetically. Another possibility is that this is a particular strata of society, if East Yorkshire society are being put in these burials that are more, uh, that tend to be more related to each other. So because they tend to be more related to each other, they're sort of from a, a smaller breeding pool. So they sort of look like they are um, highly genetically drifted and most of the population who presumably looked more like other people from Britain are getting treated in ways that we just don't see uh, archaeologically, that this is sort of a, a, stra a specific strata of society that we see in these burials. Uh, another interesting thing that we see in uh, um, for, that we looked at in this paper was looking at what's called effective population size. So this isn't census population size. This is essentially how many people at any particular point in time were uh, reproducing. Um, and we can track this through, it, 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 it's very um, um, debatable how far you can link this to actual population size or so census population size. But at the very least, it helps us track um, changes in population, potentially changes in population size uh, uh, through time. And you can see that um, population size through the Neolithic and into the Calculic and early Bronze Age um, stays around the same, maybe slightly higher in the cal Calculic, sorry, as this line goes down, the population is actually going up, I should explain, I know that's confusing. It's just um, the sort of measurement that it uses. So, um, the early Bronze Age isn't that much different from the, the pre prior Neolithic period, from what we can tell. But then when you start getting to the Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age in, uh, and the Iron Age, uh, the population in uh, Britain seems to uh, seems to accelerate significantly. So something is happening in Britain around that time, starting from the Middle Bronze Age, which um, really um, increases uh, the uh, population of, of Britain. And that before this point, it's likely that the population of Britain was actually a lot smaller than maybe we've previously envisioned in the Neolithic and the Calculated to Early Bronze Age. It might not have been, um, based on these numbers, it might not have even been over 50,000 people. It might, and it would suggest perhaps not over uh, 100,000 people, uh, and, and certainly not over 100,000 people, but that um, it depends how well this relates to census population size, which is a tricky business. But even bearing that in mind, the tricky relationship between effective population size and census population size, this suggests that there was probably a lot fewer people potentially living in Britain in the Neolithic and early Bronze Age than we previously envisioned. So having established the sort of these patterns of, um, of uh, migration in the um, uh, late Bronze Age and, and sort of apparently the lack of significant migrations in the Iron Age, one of the things that particularly geneticists wanted to talk about was uh, Celtic languages. Um, so just to give a bit of background here, there are um, two types of main types of Celtic language that were spoken um, southern Brit uh, that were spoken in Britain, uh, what's called a Britonic uh, Lang Celtic, which uh, is what Welsh is and uh, Cornish are related to and what was spoken presumably in uh, southern Britain. And then there's a uh, 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 well, it, during the Iron Age, at least. Uh, and there's Godelic Celtic, which was spoken in parts of Northern Britain, so present day Scotland uh, and Ireland. So what uh, Irish and, and Gaelic uh, is descended from. Um, and uh, there's always been 
uh, ongoing debate, and, and so you have Celtic languages uh, also in parts of Iberia and uh, uh, other parts of Europe. You can, you can see in this uh, map as well. Um, and there are, there's been there's lots and lots of theories about the development of Celtic languages and um, sort of uh, language in particular places can change as a result of other processes besides migration. But migration is such an irresistible vector for language change that, that when you see it, uh, you sort of have to wonder about whether it is linked to language, uh, any kind of sort of a language change that's hypothesized for a particular period of time. And um, this is really uh, reducing it down to very simplistic terms, but there, there was, there's loads of theories, but there, there were a couple of main ones that um, Celtic languages developed in situ in Britain and uh, other parts of Atlantic Europe from the early Bronze Age as a sort of lingua, lingua, franca, uh, lingua franca for uh, trade. Older theories uh, thought that Celtic languages were potentially introduced to Britain as a result of migrations that occurred in the Iron Age linked to the development of what's called Celtic art, so um, Latin art, so that would be quite late on um, uh, in, the, in the Iron Age. Um, but our genetic data, so the fact that we seem to find no evidence for substantial population movements um, into the Iron Age, um, but we do see sort of a migration, so in the middle, late Bronze Age, suggests that, means that the, the sort of late Bronze Age, middle Bronze Age migrations present, uh, present a plausible vector for the introduction of Celtic languages uh, into Britain. Um, however, the fact that we only really see this change in southern Britain suggests that it might just be related to Britonic and that maybe uh, Gaelic languages uh, were already being spoken in Britain before these migrations took place and had developed uh, and had actually developed uh, insularly. So it could just be a, a Britonic thing. The alternative hypothesis is that it, it was just Celtic languages and that Pictish, um, the language that was being uh, that, that was spoken in Scotland um, up until the early medieval uh, period uh, was actually a non-Celtic uh, language. So there's, again, a, getting into a linguistic debates that are totally beyond my ken, but um, there's also a debate about whether Pictish was a Celtic language or was just a different type of Indo-European uh, language, and there's still debate uh, either way. So whether we think the, these migrations introduced Celtic languages generally, or just Britonic languages specifically, depends on whether or not, to some extent, you believe um, that a Pictish is either uh, a non-Celtic or a Celtic Indo-European uh, language. And it could be because, you know, genetics can't tell you what language somebody spoke. It could be that this is somehow unrelated to Celtic languages and we're totally barking up the wrong tree. It's just that, um, again, because migration presents such an irresistible vector for language change, it seems um, it would have been uh, dishonest of us not to have at least mentioned the possibility in the, when we talked about it in the paper. Moving on to the milk part of the talk briefly. Um, so for those who maybe don't know, um, lactose tolerance is, or lactase persistence, as it's known, is, a, is sort of a genetic variant that is linked to a genetic variant which means you carry on producing the lactase enzyme in your gut, which breaks down lactose and sugar beyond infancy. So uh, obviously when you're an infant, you produce lactose to break down, uh, uh, lactase to break down your mother's milk, but then uh, the gene sort of switches off, so you stop producing it. What this genetic variant does is essentially tells that uh, gene to, uh, tells that variant to carry on um, producing uh, lactase so that you can drink milk into adulthood. And until a few years ago, the standard idea of lactose persistence and this sort of chart I've shown shows you rates of lactose persistence worldwide, sort of uh, lactose persistence in parts of Africa and um, the Near East are a slightly different genetic variant but in the same gene and to Northern Europe. You can see the rates are quite high in Northern Europe and Britain specifically. The idea is that, that this allele, so this genetic variant becomes common when people start farming because milk is so nutritious that it immediately when you start farming it becomes highly advantageous to be able to uh, drink raw milk. However, um, the, 
ancient genomes that have been generated over the past 10 years or so, or so, or so from nearly, I think, Bronze Age, Britain and Europe show that actually lactose tolerance was very rare throughout these periods. It was, um, it was there, but at incredibly low frequencies. But this is puzzling because there's, there's plenty of evidence for dairying in these uh, cultures. So it's possible that they were turning milk into um, yogurt or cheese, which reduces the lactose content and make, makes them more uh, palatable for people who are lactose intolerant. Also, it may be that perhaps we're overstating the uh, effects of lactose intolerance in that people do, uh, people can get quite poorly from them, but most of the time people have only mild or potentially no symptoms at all. So it sort of wouldn't have been so life-changing that that it would have stopped a vast majority of the population from, from drinking milk. And so perhaps that's why we don't see it uh, appearing in Neolithic and Bronze Age people. However, when, when we looked at our samples, you can see that the lactose persistent uh, allele rises in Britain specifically from this middle Bronze Age. And um, this rise and gets to around 50% prevalence by around 500 BC. So today it's about 75% prevalent in Britain. Um, this isn't linked to that this, this migration I spoke about. Um, the people who are migrating into Britain don't seem to have any higher rate of this lactose persistence genetic variant than, than the local people do. So there's something about the early Iron Age in Britain that is stimulating selection on uh, the ability to drink raw milk specifically. And this is something that happens that in Britain specifically and then happens in other parts of continental Europe later on. Um, to be honest, we have absolutely no idea as to, <laughs> as to what is causing this. Uh, I mean, people are gonna start trying to test different theories. It could be that um, the large population that growth that we see in the middle Bronze Age uh, basically when you have a higher population selection can occur at a, a greater rate so perhaps that's what's happened it's linked to population growth it could be a greater economic emphasis on dairying or greater selective pressures for instance if there's a famine um uh if you're able to drink milk it's a, a clean water it, if you have something that you can extract milk from it's a clean uh, water source and if uh or liquor, sorry moisture source and then if um you're uh but if you're lactose intolerant, that can give you potentially diarrhea. And then in that kind of famine situation or uh, that the, the diarrhea could actually be the difference between uh, uh, life or death. So it could be something to do with potentially catastrophes or, or famines occurring in Britain specifically during this time, but then happening later in Europe for some reason. But really, there's, there's no explanation that quite fits correctly. And it's particularly strange that the selection on this lactose lactose persistence gene is so rapid so you know happening within the last 1500 years which in evolutionary terms is, is less than a, uh, sorry 2500 years which in evolutionary terms is less than a blink of an eye um and yet being lactose intolerant doesn't seem to have too bad side effects most of the time for people so why it would have such there'd be such a selective pressure like literally life or death in terms of a, at a population level on your ability to drink raw milk is a, still a bit of a mystery to be honest, but it's an interesting finding that it happens in Britain first specifically before uh, anywhere else and what the circumstances are that produces that. Uh, we also looked at variants linked to uh, pigmentation. And again, as many of you might be aware, human pigmentation is something that uh, in Europe is something that's been um, the, the, the sort of standard theories that were sort of accepted a few years ago are, um, are sort of getting more complicated now. So the idea, before ancient DNA was that humans in higher latitudes become depigmented rapidly in response to um, the, the lower levels of sunlight because um, your body can use uh, UV light to synthesize vitamin D. So if you have, uh, when you're lighter skinned, you're better at absorbing, absorbing the, the UV light than if you're darker skinned. So if you're darker skinned, there's a higher chance of getting uh, vitamin D deficiency in northern latitudes. Excuse me. And we do see gradual selection towards lighter skin pigmentation in northern Europe, but it's nowhere near as fast or as complete as we expected it might be uh, initially. Um, and most depigmentation people in Britain specifically, but Europe has, has, has occurred relatively recently in the last 6,000 years. In Europe, more generally, it's only been really over the last um, 8,000 years or so, with most of that occurring in uh, the last few thousand uh, years. So in Britain specifically, uh, the, the way that this is often explored is looking at these 
variants of these genes called SLC45A2 and SLC2485 because they explain the largest proportion of variation in light skin, skin pigmentation between uh, people from Europe and people from other parts uh, of the world. Both of these uh, light, lighter skin pigmentation variants are absent in people who lived in Britain during the uh, Mesolithic. And then both are introduced in the Neolithic by people carrying this um, uh, early European farmer ancestry, although one of them is still quite low. So generally it's thought that they, when you, when you sort of attempt to predict skin pigmentation in people who lived in Neolithic Britain, it comes out as being sort of intermediate. So sort of, which you can read it as kind of colloquially as olive skinned or uh, sort of slightly darker skinned uh, uh, people. This variant, this variant becomes more, this other variant SLC45A2 becomes more frequent with people moving in from um, as part of these uh, uh, beaker migrations. So it seems to be that uh, these two populations, so the, the, the people who are living in, it gets more complicated because the people who are living on the step don't have particularly high frequency of, of this other variant SLC45A2, but then when they mix um, with groups in Central Europe, uh, groups of uh, people carrying this early farm ancestry in Central Europe and selection acts for a few hundred years, then they seem to get sort of slightly higher frequencies of uh, this ge uh, genetic variant. So when, when these people move into Britain, they sort of bring a higher frequency of this, uh, of, of, of this variant, but uh, the frequency of these uh, of that particular variant is still not as high today and carries on going, undergoing selection through the Iron Age and um, sort of beyond that point. So it's likely that on the whole Iron Age groups in Britain were probably generally slightly darker pigmented than people who live in, uh, than, we, than we think of as being typical of uh, Britain today. I think what this, you know, a lot of people sometimes ask me in these talks is when did the population of Britain, when did when did the population of Britain become us, so so to speak? But to me, it's really it's uh, and and so it's a bit of a it's a question that is inapplicable to genetics to some extent. But I can understand what people are trying to ask when the people look and are genetically the same as the people who live here today. But what I would say is that particularly what this shows is that pigmentation particularly is constantly varying through time. And so is genetic ancestry as well. There's no point at which we can pinpoint and say this is when this pop this is when the population of Britain uh, emerged. Um, we are not the end point, or the population of Britain are not an end point of some process. You know, we're uh, sort of a, an, a, another point within a sort of a, a continuum of genetic ancestry and phenotypic change that's going to go on uh, forever. So it, it's the wrong way of, to meet my mind, thinking about it. It's like we are genetically and look different from the people who lived in Britain uh, in the past and we will be, we will, we are genetically different and we will look different from the people who live in Britain in the future. It's just sort of, that's just how genetic works. Genetics is always changing in one way or the other. So just to conclude, um, so there were, as, 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 as hopefully I've, I've shown, there were substantial migrations to Britain at the end of the uh, Bronze Age. And they had a re regionally variable influence with a greater impact, particularly in the Southeast, but on average around half of the ancestry of people living in southern, what is now southern England, uh, sorry, in southern Britain, so what is now England, uh, was uh, dis was shifted by these migrations. And this occurred in the context of increasing links across Europe in trade and social practice, and a peak of human mobility across Europe more generally. Um, they're likely multi-directional migrations with people moving all over and homogenizing ancestry all over Europe, where there seems to be a distinct emanation from possibly uh, southern or alpine France. Um, seems to be a lack of evidence for migrations in the Iron Age, which suggests that these late Bronze Age migrations may have introduced Celtic or Britonic languages to Britain. Uh, and uh, lactase persistence rapidly increases in Britain uh, through the Iron Age. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, again, pigmentation genetics were also uh, uh, changing uh, through the Iron Age as well. And um, again, as well as lactose persistence, pigment lighter pigmentation is something that seems to be in a much more recent phenomenon in Britain than had previously um, been conceived. So with that, I want to say thank you. And thank you for David to, uh, for uh, inviting me and obviously for all his help, all the times that we've come back to sample his collections. I'm sure in the future we'll want to come back and sample, look at collections in the, the Wiltshire Museum because it's a, it's a very cool stuff in there. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Brilliant to hear. And of course, it's the least of that does all the hard work. <laughs> I just push a few bits of 
bits of paper around. Yes, definitely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. No, um, it, so really fascinating. Um, can I uh, uh, can I start off with a question from me, which is I noticed you got your chart of your map of Britain with all the pie charts with the amount of sort of European uh, EEF in ancestry. Shetland was quite high, very different to Scotland. Yeah. Do, do you think uh, the obvious assumption is whether that's people coming over from Norway, what that says about um, uh, yeah, uh, it's not shipping. something, I mean, um, it, the, the problem with those, to some extent, I, I'd have to look at how many samples that we have from there. So what, what is difficult to include on a pie chart, but they're, they're sort of visually quite appealing to people sometimes, is you can't really include the sort of error margins on those um, estimates. Uh, so it, um, it could just be... Um, like this I don't think there are many samples from Shetland and I don't know how off the top of my head I don't, I'm not, not sure what quality um they're at but yeah I would I would maybe slightly take that with a, a pinch of Huge salt pinch when you look at Scotland salt. all packed together it's very yeah there's um there because I would expect as well that any migrations from Norway would actually introduce less we would sort of, sort of reduce the 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 farmer ancestry if, if anything but um uh yeah, uh, yeah, I, th I think that would, when, when you look at Scotland as a whole, when you include sort of Shetland and all the Scottish samples together, there's hardly any change. So, um, uh, I think that, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah don't, don't read too much into it, it. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay. Lynn, Lynn has asked, uh, regarding lactose intolerance, uh, lactose intolerance, uh, persistence, sorry, were there any ways to measure how long children were breastfed? I understand that there were Iron Age baby feeders shown that sh shows the babies would give them milk other than that from their mothers. Could the difference in Britain be associated with early weaning to dairy, perhaps cultural, as women took on roles away from ch child rearing more frequently? Just thoughts. Yeah, that, that's actually one of the possible theories because it means that if you can wean a child earlier, um, you can have more children. Uh, and it can also be supportive of uh, because there's the, there's a there's a lower gap between the children that you have, and there's also it it means that your it can sometimes mean that your child is more likely to survive infancy, which is a, a big deal because if you survive infancy, then often uh, your life expectancy is actually pretty good once you get past the infancy because of high high how high infant mortality was. So actually, yeah, that's one. And obviously, natural selection is all about having children that survive until adulthood. So. Um, um if being able to drink milk beyond infancy allowed people to wean quicker and uh allowed you to have more children and more children survive and that could potentially explain um some of it and it, it, yeah it is one of the theories that could uh, explain it in, in, basically reducing infant mortality is the best single way of uh, ins uh ensuring sort of your uh that your genes get passed on into the into the future, the genes of the, the people, the population that you're from. Okay, it has two, such a big impact. Two related questions from David and Penny, um, which is, did you say the human population in Britain in the Neolithic was around 4,000? And related to that is Penny said, how, how can you estimate the population from your DNA samples? Could you say a little more about that? Yeah, sorry, 4,000. I should be aware about this. It isn't that that, that um, census populations we think were in Britain, population size were reproducing in Britain, or at least kind of. So, sorry, Tom. You, uh, that we have. Tom, for me, you're breaking up a bit. I'm uh, not sure about so others. Census population size will be many times more than that. Um, sorry, I dropped out then. I'm... You did, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll have to start again because it went, went a bit weird just as you started answering yeah, the my, question. With my internet, for some reason, it, it um, conked oh, up. It wasn't some... mine. So, sorry, uh, as I was saying, yeah, um, so it's... It's effective population size, not census population size. And relating effective and census population size is very tricky. Uh, 
usually census population size is many times many fold more than the um times the effective population size so again the, the, those numbers shouldn't be taken too literally but even sort of the biggest estimates for the relationship between effective and census population size would suggest um that there was still that the um population size in neolithic and bronze age britain wasn't particularly large unless um we're only sampling from uh, a small section of the population that are quite related, sort of significantly related to each other, more related to each other than they are to other parts of the population, which may or may not be true because depending, depending on where our samples come from. Um, um, and in terms of how it's done, essentially it looks at how genetically diverse your uh, population is and how often relatives are turning up in your sample as well so if you're picking up relatives all the time it either means that um you're sampling a very small subset of the population that are generally more related or this is actually quite a small population um and you can use how 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 often relatives are turning up to create a figure of this effective um population size you also as well to, to support that can look at this figure called runs of homozygosity, which is essentially in your genome, um, how often different individuals have the same sort of lengths of similar sequences in their genome, which is to do with how, again, how related they are to each other. So if you're getting lots of people turning up and having these long runs of homozygosity in common, it suggests that they're coming from a population that isn't very large. And that again, that can be quantified as an effective population size. But again, the, the caveat to that is that if we're sampling from a, a group of people that are generally more related to each other than to the rest of the population anyway, then we'll get a misleading idea of effective population size. So it's a tricky thing to interpret, but the, the sort of, unless we get further information, the primary way to interpret is, is that population sizes maybe possibly weren't so big in the Neolithic and early Bronze Age and then rose significantly into the Middle Bronze Age and, and, and Iron Age. I hope that sort of made sense. <laughs> so. um, it's quite technical, the uh, yeah, yeah. Size stuff. I think at that point, I just nod and say, I, I trust <laughs> you because I think you know what you're talking about on a good day. Um, Catherine's said, um, it's a wonderful talk. She said, I'm intrigued by the high incidence of celiac disease in the Irish population. Did the DNA, DNA studies look at this and see any reason for population differences? I don't think we have looked at celiac disease, but I think it's partly because what people tend to go for at the moment is the low hanging fruit. There are certain things like lactase persistence and, and odd other dietary adaptations that we know to one major variant, which is which is explaining a lot of the variation. The problem with stuff like celiac disease, and to be honest, most of the human diseases is it's not just one variant, it's hundreds, maybe thousands of genetic variants distributed across a person's whole genome. So actually analyzing that and tracking that through time in ancient DNA, which tends to be a bit, um, which can be very uh, variable in terms of its quality across the genome is very difficult. So yeah, basically no one's looked at celiac disease yet. Uh, because it's difficult to look at and there are easier things to look at that we can look at first, but I'm sure someone will, this will be something that we'll be able, be able to investigate in future. Sorry, I might, I might have cut out part, through part of that. Did, did you yeah, get I think, that? I think we got the, the, the key bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone said, to what extent do you think your results might have been biased by selecting samples from high status ruling elite rather than the mass of the population? So it, it might be true in, in terms of these uh, I know in terms of these late Bronze Age migrations, it seems unlikely because um, you get such a stable signature of that change all the way through the, the Iron Age. So um, and, and, and beyond as well. So, so we can still see this genetic change in present day in genomes of people from present day Britain. So when we see that change occur, um, Either you know that that would mean that we'd have to be sort of consistently sampling higher status people all the way through the the Iron Age, 
um, in order to, to miss that out. Because if if there were lower status people that um, um, were maintaining the signature of the people that were inhabiting Britain during the early Bronze Age, then we should see them start to crop up in the uh, in the Iron Age or or later periods, or even in modern day people, we should see a difference, but we don't see um, any sort of reversal of this genetic change at any point in time, uh, in sort of modern genomes. So we know that when this genetic change occurs, it is sort of uh, permanent across the whole uh, population. Whether it occurs in elites first and then disperses amongst the population more slowly than, than what we can see, that's another question, but definitely it occurs uh, to some extent or another over that period in the Middle Bronze Age and into the early Iron Age. We can say that with, with some certainty, we, even, um, even if we have a biased sample potentially in the, in the Middle and Late Bronze Age. Thanks. Uh, Johan said, um, you said that Neolithic enclaves seem to have persisted for a couple of centuries after the arrival of Beaker people, but I noticed a level of confidence in the radiocarbon dates around the time seem to be a couple of hundred years. So what's the level of confidence about the length of time those enclaves may have persisted? Um, I think, well, I mean, some of the radiocarbon dates are quite wide, but some are, um, are quite tight as well. I think, um, even with those couple of hundred years, well, I mean, even if my place that we have some that have tighter dates where they do seem to have ancestry from the uh, British Neolithic. So I think they are supportive. Also, you can, when you look at the ancestry of people in early Bronze Age, Calcolithic Britain, you can model them as um, having ancestry derived from the British Neolithic, whereas the people who um are in whether the ancestry that comes in during the middle bronze age as i mentioned earlier on it doesn't fit the ancestry from the british neolithic so there, there's definitely some uh british neolithic um ancestry in those in those populations and basically the amount of variation that you get with those even with the samples with the tighter radiocarbon dates still indicates some kind of enclaves persisting um, through what is quite a long period from 2500 to about one to about 2000 BC. Thanks. And um, Jack has said, can you say uh, more about how you see the, and I never know how to pronounce this, good Godelic branch of Celtic? Uh, I mean, I have, I have no opinion on it in, in some respects because. I'm not that interested in the language personally, um, and I'm not a linguist, and I'm not um, familiar enough with the linguistics evidence to be able to um, to be able to sort this out. My understanding is that the, the reason why the main reason why some people have issues with the idea of Godelic forming in Britain during the early Bronze Age and then Britonic coming in much later, sort of um, maybe millennium later as a result of these migrations potentially, is that uh, they're not that different. Um, and you would expect that if they'd have been separated for that amount of time, then um, they'll be much more different from each other than they actually are. So this is why um, the idea is, is that uh, they both come into this is why some people favor the idea that they both have to come in together and then it's basically regional separation as, uh, and also sort of assimilation with languages that are already that are the sort of pre um, celtic languages that were already in britain that then creates the difference between the godelic and the and the and the britonic and uh but again you'll be able to find linguists who think that criticism is um is un unfounded as well but the, that's the idea that um, Godelic and Britonic are not different enough for uh, them to have been separated by hundreds of years in this way, so they must have come in together, but then it's explaining uh, why you don't see these ancestry change in Scotland and probably not to a great extent in Ireland as well, where uh, we know Godelic languages were, were spoken and so sort of it can explain, you know, you can explain it with Pictish potentially, but it definitely doesn't explain Godelic unless you believe that people in Ireland were speaking uh, a non-Celtic language as well. 
which I'm, I don't think there's as much evidence for. Yeah, so it's a tricky situation and it's it's not straightforward. And I, I really don't have the linguistic knowledge to, because it does come down to linguistics and not the DNA. Um, yeah, I don't have the linguistic knowledge to pick between these situations. You know, it could be that, that yeah, the Celtic languages spread into these other these certain parts of southern Britain by migration and then they were somehow got dispersed into Ireland and uh, Scotland through means that didn't involve my, migration and that's that's a, a totally reasonable scenario as well so it's still something that's going to be raked over and might you know be difficult to totally resolve. Okay thanks. Um, Maggie has asked uh, could pigmentation be linked to changing climate conditions in late Bronze Age Iron Age Northern Europe? Uh, perhaps it's sort of um, there's definitely the model of vitamin D deficiency definitely works, but there seems to be something go, else going on, particularly with that um, other variant with it with it sort of becoming more common more late. It might be I didn't talk about it. It might be yeah. I mean it could be potentially climatic, although I'm not sure what climatic change could have occurred which would have dramatically reduced sunlight to the extent that. Uh, it would have it would have caused such such um, strong selection on these particular variants, but it could be dietary. It could be um, uh, if people aren't getting as much vitamin D from their diet, then um, that could be sort of driving this very gradual um, uh, selection. Um, and that's what was positive for why particularly the Mesolithic hunter gatherers don't seem to have these uh, particularly strong lighter skin pigmentation alleles. It might be because that their broader diet meant that they were getting more vitamin D from the diet, so they didn't need to adapt to have such paler skin. But likely it's, it's a combination of things, as, as all, always these things are. <laughs> okay, I think you'll be relieved to know, I think we probably will be drawing questions to, to a, a more or less a close. There's a few, but um, two, two particularly to ask you. One from Wynne. Um, are you able to say whether the late Bronze Age migration to Southern Britain was much greater than the post-Roman migrations? In other words, is the population of Britain in the last couple of thousand years fairly similar to how it was in the Iron Age? Um, on that quest, uh, there's some interesting thing. Um, there's some interesting things that I've been privy to as to what happens in the first millennium AD, but I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I vaguely know the answer to that question. but uh, So active, active research. Ex yeah, exactly. So sorry, sorry to be a tease. I could just say that I, I don't know. But yeah, that this, the, watch, watch this space. Yeah, there might be something yeah. later this year that um, helps to resolve that question to some extent. Yeah. OK. That's a and then in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a part of it is potentially so sort of slightly counterintuitive. But but uh, we yeah, we'll see. Yeah. OK. And a nice, nice, sort of easy one to finish with, with from Graham is, thank you. Please, can you recommend a suitable book or source which would help us understand more? Sorry, my internet cut out a bit. Can you just repeat yeah. the question a bit? Can, can you recommend a suitable book or source which would help us understand more? I've actually got a link to your nature article uh, ready to put into the chat. Cool. Yeah, hopefully that would to some extent understandable. The book I tend to recommend, uh, although it is still quite quite technical, but explains what sort of happened over the last 10 years or so. It might be slightly out of date now because it moves. I mean, even though it came out in 2017, because um, uh, just because the field moves so fast is David Reich's Who We Are and How We Got Here. Um, it, it's not focused on Britain specifically. It's focused on the whole world um, and, and the work particularly that his lab has done but it tries to at least there's some quite technical bits in it but it tries to at least explain in simple terms what's happened and um what we've learned and it includes some stuff about britain as well excellent so i'm just taking a, a link to that and popping it in the chat as well um and could i just say how uh, the um, one of the most amazing things about your your publication in nature is the number of authors that are credited <laughs> this is something i've highlighted to colleagues in historic england which is that it gives a credit to all the museum curators across the, europe who have given access to their collections and it treats them as co-authors and i've never seen that recognition 
by researchers in that way before. So we get a huge long list, but it, it's brilliant because it does recognize the value, the, the importance of museum collections and how, well, and this is something you said often to us, Tom, you couldn't be doing your work if, if it were not for those museum collections. No, for sure. I mean, none of this would have happened if these museum collections weren't extant. I mean, these, I mean, like some of yours were dug up a uh, hundred years ago where, you know, there was no even prospect of the kind of things that we're doing now. So the fact that they've been looked after, it shows the value of looking after them for, you know, who knows what we'll be able to do with them in another hundred years. So the importance of keeping them and having good records of the provenances is sort of paramount at the moment in order to make sure that we can carry on doing this kind of work and um, finding more about uh, these people. Okay, so with that, a huge thanks, Tom, for, for giving the talk tonight. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I, I understand the, even a bit more of the science than I did when I wrote the, uh, when I read your Nature article. Oh, good. <laughs> absolutely brilliant. So, uh, you know, absolutely amazing research and bring complete new insights into, into British archaeology. Amazing. So gonna, a very big thank you. And thank you for everyone for coming along. And uh, perhaps we can get you back another time when you do your next bit of research. Oh, yes. Happy to whenever. Yes. <laughs> OK, thanks very much, Tom, and good night and good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>